This episode is brought to you by ThreatLocker. ThreatLocker cyber heroes believe that you should have complete network control and not live in fear of the next malware attack. ThreatLocker's powerful suite of security tools are designed so that MSPs can easily and directly control exactly what applications run in their clients' endpoints, wherever those endpoints happen to be. We believe zero trust should be low management and fast to deploy. We created ThreatLocker to make this vision a reality. To learn more or set up a demo to see it yourself, visit ThreatLocker.com. You're entering the MSP Zone, a podcast for the managed services community, covering news, analysis, and interviews from around the globe. Elevate your MSP game by staying in the MSP Zone. And now, your host, Charles Weaver. What do you think? Is it time for a new theme song? I don't know. Used to the the old one. It's uh, it's grown on me. I gotta say, <laughs> we we gotta we gotta we gotta hire the band to come back in the studio and, and lay down some more tracks for us for for 2022. Anyway, it's the MSP Zone. It's 2022, and it's Brian Stoner from Stellar Cyber. Welcome. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. So what? <laughs> I think the last time you and I spoke, we were getting kind of like a debrief on the on the whole supply chain, you know, attack on MSPs and and getting lots of uh, gory details about what what MSPs were facing. Um, I think I've learned a lot. I think a lot of the MSPs have learned a lot about um, ransomware, cyber attacks, and and not defeating them, but but recovering from them. Just as a high at a high level, what what have you guys learned there? What have you learned personally that you know is kind of a, a new uh, a, a new a new tidbit of, of knowledge that you've you've gleaned in, since we last spoke? Well, so I think since we last spoke, we had the Kaseya incident, or was it right around the same time? Because I think we're talking. Solar winds last time, right? It may have been right in between, so maybe you're right. It was yeah. before Kaseya, but after Solar winds. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I think a couple of things. I, I think this year, more than any other, customers are beginning to realize that they need their managed security providers to help them in this area, and so I think it's really important that you know, regardless of what the threat vector is, um, we need to be more educated about how we explain what's happening um, to our customers. And so one of the things that we did, um, you know, Kaseya, I think, caught a lot of people off guard, even after solar winds, right? Sure. Which, you know, I think anything catches you off guard if you've never seen it before, right? But What I think we really learned um, from that here at Stellar Cyber is that if you can use different types of machine learning to detect anomalous behavior, you can actually detect these things before your customer calls you and says they saw it on the news or, um, you know, received an email about it, you know. So, Brian, you bring up something really critical for 20 plus years what I have heard from MSPs is the reason you use an MSP, you hire an MSP in the first place is so that you don't have to be the one calling up or emailing and saying the printer's down, the server's down, the email's down, something doesn't work, can you fix it? Which was the old way. Mm -hmm. And getting an MSP meant the MSP figures this stuff out in advance and they tell you almost before you've even heard about it. Why is it that the thing that you just said is what I would expect an MSP to, to, to be doing anyway? But I understand you're talking about, you know, kind of upper echelon cyber threats and attacks. You get what I'm saying? It, it, this is like not new territory for the MSP, but it sounds like it is from the security standpoint. Yeah, so from a security standpoint, the challenge is, most security tools, when you get right down to it, have to know what they're looking for before they find it. So from that perspective, by most definitions, cybersecurity tools in general are reactive. 
whenever anyone says log to you, that means something has already happened. Okay. <laughs> So you're talking forensics and you're talking about going back into the crime scene and and finding out what happened. Yeah, well, and so that's why, like, as the whole thing with Kaseya rolled out, you know, you saw after a couple of days there was another notice and a couple of days they talked about how bad it was and how many people were infected, right? So what I'm talking about is there are tools now similar to the ones that we've developed that use machine learning in a different way than using log-based detections. Um, when you when you have a SIM or a security technology that has to know what it's looking for, right? You have to collect that and you have to write a rule for it. And rules are kind of a binary thing, right? If I fail to log in five times, if I have a rule that says send an alert, it'll send an alert, right? But maybe... I'm not the best at remembering my password. And on a Monday morning after a long weekend, I might fat finger that five times. Well, that's not necessarily anomalous and they could probably call me and figure that out, right? But if I had machine learning that knew that me as a user logged into that computer at pretty much the same time, you know, every day of the week and I occasionally on a Monday after a long weekend, you know, would would maybe fat finger my password a few extra times, right? Now I'm doing something proactive using the reactive data, knowing what my behavior is, right? And so machine learning can do that for service providers. And I think what's really interesting for your audience is that if you're building security services, it's much easier to leverage machine learning to detect a lot of these things than to have a group of guys that have to understand writing rules for all of your customers, right? So now we're talking about, you know, we were able to detect Kaseya without any signature or file or anything. As a matter of fact, within 24 hours, our platform across all of our partners, and we have over 100 globally now, detected over 1,200 different command and control websites that were associated with the Kaseya attack. So they were creating unique websites that would get around, you know, all of your URL reputation, you know, and, and your endpoints and your firewalls and things like that. So I'm just suggesting that, um, you know, we need to start thinking a little bit differently about how we detect things sure. because that's going to help us be proactive. So, you know, I can call my customer and say, we're seeing this anomalous behavior. It hasn't been associated with anything yet, but here's what we need to do to make sure that you protect yourself. So I, I, I got a couple of questions to ask because mm-hmm. I, I accept everything you're saying, but it, it seems like MSPs had been, proactive in almost everything except for security up until recent years. And and I want to be very clear to anyone listening to this. This is not, I, Brian, I don't think you're saying it. I certainly am not saying it, that this was a fault of the MSPs. The MSPs were just dealing with the technology they had at the time. I mean, exactly. I mean, yes. is, you accept that as a, as a given? Yep. Okay. I do. So, I mean, and, and if you MSPs are out there saying, well, Geez, what Brian's describing sounds really familiar. I mean, I classified it as event correlation, right? I mean, what MSPs had to do in the old days before the machine learning came around is they had to manually link up, right? If they had 100 tickets, you know, being created because there was a power outage in a, in a particular area. Well, they had to figure right. out, right, what's the root cause of it and then deal with one, not 100 tickets. It doesn't sound like you're talking about something, anything really different other than that, I mean, I, I hate to oversimplify, but yeah, it's a very similar concept, right? And if you can catch something in its early stages before it cascades, kind of like what you're talking about, right? If there's a power outage, um, I might start getting reports from multiple things about that power outage, but the root cause is still the power outage, right? Yeah. So, so that's why we have taken the extra step to build uh, a framework for our partners to kind of understand these things much more simply. Um, we call it the XDR kill chain, but it's really just the MITRE ATT&CK framework 
and the Lockheed Martin kill chain kind of rolled into a loop. And so there's, you know, six stages in the loop. And the earlier you catch them in that, you know, model, the less chance they're going to have to do damage the rest of the way, right? So um, if you catch it and understand where the source is early, then you can put mitigation in place to keep it from cascading and, and becoming larger. I, I like, by the way, I like kill chain. That's more of a badass term if you Cobra Kai mm-hmm. term. <laughs> it is. It is. Yes. So, I, I mean, I want to get back to because I, I, I like I like thinking about things in, in their most simplest simplistic form, and I think that for a long time MSPs had been familiar with traditional firewalls, then UTM, then um, then more advanced technologies that by and large, are still either doing blacklisting, whitelisting, mm-hmm. or some form of, of a policy-based block this if it comes in. But if something new that we haven't looked at, the, the new, the zero-day stuff is, is the stuff that is the problem and is becoming more frequent. Did I characterize it somewhat yeah, accurately? Yeah, you, you did. And I think the additional challenge is that each manufacturer looks at a zero-day differently. Explain so that. Explain that because that's your, important. Your, your endpoint manufacturer looks at zero day as, oh, this is a file or this is something that the endpoint is doing that I need to stop. Okay. The firewall looks at a, a zero day completely differently. A firewall says, I'm a traffic cop. Do I believe this is good or bad? If it's bad, I block it. If it's good, I let it go. Right. Um, if I'm using a user behavior technology, um, you know, I'm, lo- I'm baselining my data set, right? So the problem is each one of these silos, right? The attackers know how to compromise each one of them individually. So unless you're connecting between those things, you don't really get a full picture and you're using human glue to try to figure out if something's really wrong. And the attackers understand how to create these complex I'll call them incidents where, you know, they don't necessarily have to send you a file via email to send you ransomware. They can brute force their way onto one of your servers and start scanning your network and dropping ransomware on computers without ever sending you an email. So, so now I think we just need to get a little bit more sophisticated also because not only are they going to be, dropping ransomware, but they've probably been doing a reconnaissance for some period of time. And maybe they found your SQL database and maybe they dumped that to a file. They created a reverse tunnel and they dropped the ransomware just to keep you as the partner busy while they're achieving their ultimate goal of stealing that SQL database. So the ransomware is really just a, a, a diversionary tactic. Much like denial of service attacks and other things in the past, um, it's used to overwhelm the security team and then they can achieve kind of their ultimate goal. Okay. So I, I don't think any of us is talking about one technology to the exclusion of others. We're talking about layered technologies. I mean, you brought up email. It's mm-hmm. common, but it's not the only way to get in w- w- via, via ransomware is I think your point. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's injection process. I mean, they can do a million different things now. Yeah. And, you know, I I also uh, was listening to another um, presentation earlier from some investors where they said, you know, if you add up all the ransomware that was paid last year, it is like triple the amount that the entire enterprise security base spends on security in a year. So, the attackers are three times better funded than the guys who are trying to protect everything. That's horrible. I didn't need to hear that, Brian. But <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's, I mean, you, you got to be aware of this stuff. But all right, could you maybe tell us a little bit about what, I mean, have the attack vectors changed? It, just say in the last 12 months, right? I, since since SolarWinds, since Kaseya, has anything changed in the tactics that the bad guys are using that that you've identified? So now it's easier to compromise individuals 
because they're not behind the corporate firewall anymore. Work from Remote, home. Yeah, work from home has created a massive new threat vector because now your users are using public Wi-Fi, they're using their cable modems, you know, whatever they have, right? And so I think that's why you saw a big tailwind for the EDR providers for the last 12, 24 months. Um, because if you can't put them behind your, you know, corporate firewall, at least you can put EDR on there and maybe see, you know, some bad behavior happening or something beyond files, you know, being loaded onto that machine. Yeah. Um, but the, the challenge is, is that let's say that that user gets compromised in some way and the attackers are good and, you know, they figure out a way to get a foothold on that machine. Well, they can just sit there and watch where the user goes, right? Do they go to AWS for their core business application? Sure. Do they go to, um, you know, Salesforce to manage their, you know, ERP, right? And the attackers will learn where they're going. They'll also learn, uh, are they using Okta? Are they using Duo, right? And they can actually compromise that user's credentials and start accessing those systems and using that remote user as a launching point. Yeah. I, e yeah. EDR by itself doesn't track all those things, right? So now you need a system that connects uh, AWS CloudTrail because the core applications in, in AWS. You need to monitor the logins for Salesforce. You need to monitor the logins for Duo and Okta and connect the user to all the things that he's using. And figure out whether someone's impersonating, someone's co-opting their credentials, what have you. Exactly. And so that's where we've built machine learning-based detections that connect these different things. They're, they're specific to remote user use cases. So, and, and I think we touched on this last year in our conversation, which is the, the, old, the old SIM model, which, which was the software aggregates the data and then the analyst, the human analyst, does the review. And that right. had been a very... Um, consistently applied practice, I think, until, mm. would you say, and this is my question, ha has machine learning decidedly won that battle where we, and I'm not saying we don't need human analysts here, um, but that for the grunt work, I'll call it, for the, for the baseline analysis of, of just monumental volumes of data that we're talking about, is it, am I correct that machine learning is the only best way to, to dig through that. Yeah, it, it automates things that are just too tedious to ask an analyst to do, right? Um, you know, I, I think what's really unique about what we do is that as we're ingesting the data from all those different sources, right, at a given point in time, we'll run that through a dozen different sources of threat intelligence. If it's bad, we know it's bad we add that to a standardized record. If it's a zero day, we run it through a sandbox, look at its behavior and we give it a reputation before we store it, right? So now I've done effectively what an analyst does when they see an alert in a SIM, but I've done it through the ingestion process instead. So now when the analyst sees something, it's already correlated with all the different sources of data. It has a description of what's happening and you know what to do. So it's a whole different approach. Yeah. I, I, I kind of want to tease what we're going to be talking about in next in, in future episodes, but I, I do want to talk about it because it's something I hear a lot from MSPs, which is that there is a belief out there that for MSPs to become, quote, MSSPs, and you may mm -hmm. have heard this theory, that the MSP has to partner with, a cybersecurity MSSP, meaning that there's mm -hmm. no way that the MSP who has been doing business for 20 plus years and had plenty of security people who know how to configure firewalls, and they, they know architecture, they know security, they know, you know, they know all the, 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 the basics and then some, that they're somehow inadequate to do this. And, and could you speak to that concept and whether or not you think it's true and where your technology with machine learning maybe breaking that mold that or the, uh, that theory 
that I've just espoused. So I think that theory is kind of perpetuated right now by those big providers. But you've, right? you've seen it though. You know, it, yeah, you know no, what I'm talking I've seen about. It. Yeah. And so uh, within my program here at um, Stellar Cyber that I've developed, um, I actually help MSPs um, step their customers into security. And when I say that, what I mean is the, the approach that you just shared, right? You have to partner with somebody, okay? What normally happens is maybe the top 10% of your customers that are super concerned about cybersecurity buy that service. What about the other 90%, right? And, and, you're, the, and just to be clear for the audience, you're talking about a selling a product that has a very distinct extra price tag to the existing managed services offering. That's what we're talking exactly. about. So, uh, uh, you know, expensive, all-in, threat-hunting, cybersecurity service, right? Yeah. Uh, so what I, what I would suggest is that start with something small if you're making the transition, eight by five, connect the things they already have and provide alerts. That's it. You don't need a sock of guys to do this. You can buy a product like ours. It'll connect everything your customers already have, and you can start providing context and alerts. Ultimately, what happens is after a couple of months, they go, hey, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity at night. Well, that's when the bad guys work. That's when you're going to see more activity. Well, we'd like you to watch it, you know, 24 by 7. Okay, but that's going to be a little extra. Great. Now they get to another point a few months later and they say, well, you know, it's great that you're waking me up at two in the morning when somebody's trying to break in, but can you just block it for me? Sure. That's an add-on charge for that, right? Then you could say, well, you know, we, we've been going now for a while and here's some repetitive things that we do on a regular basis. I have automation built into my platform that we could do this. We could automate the response for this at the early parts of the kill chain. We'll have less to clean up or, you know, it'll be cheaper for you. Great, let's do it. We'll charge you a little extra for that, right? And so now you can engage 100% of your customer base with different levels of service that don't break the bank, right? Yeah, big, so I, I really like that. And, and by the way, the, the, the MSP in, in your um, kind of scenario there, they're being an analyst. When they start to identify trends, that's what an analyst does is they, they spot those things. Well, and most of their customers rely on them to remediate whatever somebody else finds anyway. So if they find it, why not get paid to remediate it too? Well, I think you have, well, I don't want to say broken the mold, but I think you've given an alternative to the, to the uh, it's not even prevalent. I don't know how prevalent it is, Brian, but I, I hear it a lot by people selling it. And I just think that the, I personally think that the model that you have laid out is the good one, which is we shouldn't be making this, a, hey, do you want the Cadillac gold plan? No. Yeah. There's no option. Everybody needs this because if we don't have this at a baseline, things are going to get really bad really quick. I mean, we may already be there, but I, I think this has to be embedded into the, the baseline foundational managed services of every MSP. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, our platform and our last release, we took it to the next level. So you remember how I just shared with you that an attacker could come from different places. So that could create multiple alerts, right? Um, we created an incident management function within our platform that correlates all the related alerts into incidents, scores them and categorizes them, you know, ranks them for the analyst. So now you don't, you don't even need a super trained guy to know that this high security risk thing that's happening needs to be remediated quickly, right? We've taken all the guesswork out of it. You don't need, you know, a $200,000 a year guy to figure it out anymore. We can figure it out at a high level and present it to the analyst so they can do something about it, right? But to your point, I think you can start off with a guy who knows the knock, right? Familiar with network services, understands IP addresses, MAC addresses. And, you know, um, there are lots of enablement options. We have a three-day course 
three hours online each day. We record it if somebody can't make it one day. Um, but that helps them, you know, configure, deploy, install, and tune the platform. That's it. And then we have a SOC analyst course for things like automated threat hunting rules and, you know, specialized reporting and things. That's like a two-day course, right? But there are a ton, and I've been learning this um, in the last year or so, I've spoken with the heads of cybersecurity departments at multiple universities. And I don't think any of them knew that our industry existed or how many people we needed, right? <laughs> it's funny. It's scary, right? How, how that it is. is real. It yeah. is because guess what? Your partners need these people or they need to upskill the people that they have. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working with people like you to try to figure out Let's stop complaining about the lack of resources. How do we find them? How do we get them focused in the right area? And how do we get them working for you? Well, that that's going to be on f- a future episode uh, where we were going to we're going to tackle that specific issue. Now that we have this fancy new technology called video, maybe on the next episode you could show. Would you be willing to show us uh, maybe a little bit about the technology, how it works, so people can. You know, we us talking about it is one thing, but them seeing it might help give some greater texture to it. If we have time, I could show it right now. Well, I, I think I think next time we'll be. I, I don't okay. want to tease it too much, but you know, we got to tease right. it a little bit. Oh, well, you know, I guess we got to leave them wanting a little bit, right? Because I, I think what you're saying is, don't don't sell them a fish, teach them how to fish, and I think that that is what has always bothered me about these these you have to become an MSSP. And the only way you do that is by you partnering with me. And I, I, I just instinctually, something always rubbed me the wrong way about that. I like what you're saying because you're actually educating and helping baseline MSP technicians understand the security, use the technology, but learn and evolve. And I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I, I would say out of, you know, probably 50 or so partners that we brought on last year, um, over half of them were exactly that. They were MSPs that were kind of holding out until they found something where they felt like they could step their customers into it. And um, it's it's been very successful for us because um, we actually created a whole uh, we call it the jumpstart program, but it's a whole onboarding and, you know, helping them with their messaging, helping them understand their profitability, help them with their packaging. I wrote, you know, template proposals and other things, you know, just to kind of help them get started, you know, get them, yeah. get them self-sufficient. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of partners that have been sitting on the fence um, to to find something like that. Uh, I, I think uh, just the whole package it into your baseline offerings and don't even make it an optional upsell because nobody needs, I mean, there, there's no upside in being a, a, a cleanup team for a, for a cyber event. I, I just don't, I, I don't see it. I mean, who wants to do that? There's no value in that. You want to stop it. You do. And, and if you don't stop it, you're going to have a much smaller customer base over time. Ain't that, ain't that the truth? <laughs> it's the sad truth, right? I mean, yeah. if you think yeah. about the cost of a, a breach at your customer and and the a lot of small businesses, I, I forget what the percentage is, but I think it's like 60 or 80% of small businesses that have a major breach go out of business within a year. That's ridiculous. And we got to do something to stop it. Um, that's unfortunately all the time today. Um Brian, we're going to have you come back, and that's going to be probably in the next uh, couple of weeks. But we're going to talk about some of the training, some of the other things that we kind of tipped our, our hand to, and maybe see even some uh, some actual Stellar Cyber uh, dashboards and technology at work. Sound good? Yeah, appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Brian, for joining us again. This is uh, Charles Weaver with MSP Zone, and we will talk to you all next time. It's the sad truth, right? I mean, yeah. if you think yeah. about 
the cost of a, a breach at your customer and and the a lot of small businesses I, I forget what the percentage is but i think it's like 60 or 80 percent of small businesses that have a major breach go out of business within a year that's ridiculous and we got to do something to stop it um that's unfortunately all the time today um Brian, we're going to have you come back, and that's going to be probably in the next uh, couple weeks. But we're going to talk about some of the training, some of the other things that we kind of tipped our our hand to, and maybe see even some some actual Stellar Cyber uh, dashboards and technology at work. Sound good? Yeah. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Brian, for joining us again. This is uh, Charles Weaver with MSP Zone, and we will talk to you all next time.